Good morning, family. Because that's what we are. We are family, are we not? Yes, yes, yes. We're not, um, we're not just a gathering of people. We are a family. We are together. We are people of different backgrounds, different nationalities, different ages, and, and people that really, you know, out there shouldn't have anything to do with each other. But we come together as a family that all believe in this person, Jesus Christ, right? So that makes me your brother. It does. You make, it makes you my sister, makes you my brother, my, my aunt, my uncle, my grandpa, my grandfather. You know, we are family, and I love being with you. I really do. One of the major reasons why I like being up on the stage in front of you is not just because, you know, I, I get to preach a message and say profound things, because I, truth be told, there are better people to say profound things, okay? I don't got that for you. I don't. But what I do have is I can give you the gift of presence. I can be with you a little bit. And so I am really looking forward to just hanging out with you today. We're going to look at some scripture. We're going to look at some, 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 uh, some revelation, things like that. Oh, and to those of you who are um, <clears throat> joining us for like the second time because Easter was your first, and I'm not going to have you raise your hands or anything because I don't want to embarrass you, but thank you for coming. What you're coming to is you're coming to a family. You're coming to a community. And so please, please, please don't just, after this, this, this um, uh, uh, service is done, don't go running out the door. Please introduce yourselves to someone. If, if nobody else, come introduce yourselves to me. I want to know you. I want to see you. I want to get to know you. I want to make eye contact with you, hug you, shake your hands, all that stuff, right? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to get you all up to speed. Oh, I should introduce myself. Um, my name is Pastor Mike, and I work in the spiritual formations department here at Metro. Okay, and that means that our department, uh, along with Pastor Hosang, uh, we are in charge of everything that is traditionally pastoral. So we're, we're, we're in charge, we're trying to get you to pray more, as Neil said, we're trying to get you to pray more, we're trying to read, get you to read your Bible more, we're trying to get you into a small group. Um, more specifically, I'm the pastor over emotional health here, okay, and... Um, <clears throat> What, uh, what that means is I, I really believe that, you know, your emotional health is deeply connected to your spiritual health. You know, you can't have one without the other. And so I lead this incredible, incredible course called um, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And uh, sorry to say, signups are all closed, but anyone who has ever gone through it can attest to how amazing the course is. So, um, but next time you come around, just keep your ears open. Just please sign up. Um, you can have it with me. Um, <clears throat> I want to get us up to speed. We are going through the book of Acts right now. And um, wasn't Easter just awesome? Yeah. It was really good. Yeah. Like really, really good. And, and I think this is the first, from what I understand, I've only been here at Metro for a couple of years or so, but for what I said, this is the first time we've had Easter in this building, like on our home turf. Something felt amazing about it. Right? Yes, the stage was a little crowded with all the dancers and things like that, but like, so there was something really amazing about doing it at home, you know? Um, <clears throat> but folks, if you remember correctly, the Easter message is something really amazing because the Easter message is that Jesus loves everyone. Why this is important is because before the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior's res uh, death and resurrection, okay? God was a God of just Jewish people, okay? He was their God. It really, that, 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 that was it, right? And after Jesus came, preached his message, did his thing, did the cross thing, and ro rose up again from, from the grave, the message became different. All of a sudden, he says, not just the Jewish people are my people, but all people of all nations are my people, Okay, Jews and Gentiles, those are the two people groups that the Bible talks about, Jews and Gentiles, okay? If you are not Jewish, you are a Gentile. We are a church of Gentiles, okay? I don't know, I mean, we might have a few Jewish people in here. I don't know you, but please come and introduce yourself if you are, okay? Um, but the majority of us are Gentiles, okay? And if it weren't for the work of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday, we would not be here. We would not be sitting in these seats. The book of Acts 
is about the proliferation of this message. The Holy Spirit, the third character in the triune God that we worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, inspires people. That's his primary role. Okay? He inspires people. And in the book of Acts, what has happened is he's inspired people to start preaching this message of inclusiveness to, to all the people of all the Gentiles in, in Jerusalem. And... <clears throat> And all of a sudden, the people start clumping together and forming these things called churches, right? We call them churches, but they, that's not what they called them back, that, back then. But basically, it's the concept of the church, right? And the book of Acts would show that the, the message was just multiplying out of control, and people were just going all over the place, not just staying in Jerusalem, but going everywhere. And namely, the book of Acts is about this guy named Paul, specifically about this guy named Paul and how the spirit has enabled him and has given him the vision to go throughout the Roman world, which was the most powerful world at the time, to spread this message to the Gentiles, to spread this message to everyone. And so I I just, um, so what happens is that his church in Antioch commissions him and his friend Barnabas, and they go out to preach this message of inclusion to everyone. And so can I get that map up real fast? I just want to get us up to speed here, okay? Um, I'm going to use my cool little toy that I specifically bought for today's service, okay? Right here. You see that? (laughs) Um, (laughs) So this is Antioch right here. This is this is where Paul's home church is. And Antioch was this beautiful church where it, it, it was amazing, all right? Back then, people were segregated, okay? Like all the, all, all the people from Africa stayed together, all the uh, people who are Roman stayed together, all the Jewish people stayed together, everybody just kind of like all over the place. But the church of Antioch, it's, it's a defining, defining thing, defining characteristic was the fact that Black people and white people and Roman people and Jewish people are all coming together to worship the same God. And this church would commission Paul and Barnabas and they would go all over the place. They would sail to Salamis, um, which maybe Salami comes from, but um, <clears throat> Salamis, Paphos, and um, go, goes into Italia and then all, all into this area, right? Um, and it ends in, in this place called Derby. Now, one of the things that you have to t- take into consideration is like, okay, so you would think that a message of inclusion, that God loves everybody, would be accepted by everybody, right? Everybody would love that message. But we have seen, folks, in our day and age, what happens to a person with a new message, something that challenges the status quo. What happens when a new message that nobody has ever heard before goes out? There's opposition. And not only is there opposition, sometimes there's violence involved because that's how hard people will fight for their truths, right? Instead of having an open heart. And so that's really what happened to poor Paul. Paul and Barnabas would go through all of these cities, and this is a long way, let me tell you. Remember, this is, you know, this was pre-cruise lines and, and, and cars and stuff like that. Everyone was, everyone was traveling by donkey, camel, and by foot, right? And he's going from all of these places, and every place that he goes to, there are people who accept the message, and then there are people who attack him openly. They persecute him. They drag him, out, drag him outside the city gates. They stone him. He gets beat the crap up. That's what happens, right? <clears throat> and so um, he's finally, finally gotten to this part right here, Derby, right? And Derby is his final destination. And then finally, the Bible tells us he comes to this city and he wins a lot of disciples, he feels like, finally, I came to a city where I wasn't beaten, I wasn't, I wasn't marred, I wasn't persecuted, but the people were open-hearted enough to receive this message. I'm done. I'm done. And so that's, <clears throat> that's where we pick up today. So our passage today comes from Acts chapter 14, verses 21 through 28. Um, and uh, you can follow along on the board. And, uh, and it says, they preached the gospel in that city, that city being Derby, okay, and won a large number of disciples. 
Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed leaders, uh, elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Let's go to God in prayer. Let's, let's ask him to bless us, family. <clears throat> Lord, our Father, the Father of this family, thank you. Thank you for all the work that you did, that you describe here in the book of Acts. Because if it weren't for your Holy Spirit inspiring Paul, inspiring all these people to form churches, we would not be here today. We enjoy so much of the wealth and the prosperity that comes from the sacrifices of Paul and the the early church today, Lord. And God, you continue to bless the church. You continue to heal the church. Lord, today, let us be healed today. Let us start taking steps to heal today because I really believe that you want that to happen because good fathers want their children to be healthy. So, Lord, we eagerly await the spiritual food that you're about to give us. Let us be nourished enough in our spirits. At the very least, let us grow more together as your family, Lord. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Did you guys see Avengers? Yes, yes. How many of you saw Avengers? Okay, show of hands, show of hands, show of hands. Okay, don't say anything. I swear to God, just... It's 11 years in the making. Don't mess this up for me, okay? I'm staying off of Facebook. I'm staying off of all social media, things like that. If if you comment on my wall and I don't respond to you right away, just know it's not you. It might, well, actually, it might be you, but um, (laughs) but it's because I'm trying to stay off of it. I don't want it to be spoiled. I hear it's amazing, okay? I don't even, I don't even want to hear that it was good, okay? Even if it's terrible, I want to like it, okay? Um, I didn't see Avengers yet. I saw Dumbo. And you know what? I can't even blame my wife. That was my idea. (laughs) I wanted to see Dumbo because, you know, I had such good memories of that weird movie from the 1980s because it's a weird movie. There's pink elephants and psychedelic stuff happening. And I have no idea what Dumbo is about except that it's a flying elephant, right? And I watched it. And man, it sucked. It was terrible. It was terrible. Don't watch Dumbo. It's really bad. <clears throat> but one thing Dumbo did well was um, they really painted a good picture of how grim it is for circus animals. Like, they did a really good job of showing how cruel people can be to animals and such. And so what that did was um, it led me to do some Googling research. And I love to Google stuff. Okay? I love Wikipedia. I love all the articles and stuff. I can, I can surf Wikipedia for hours. Right? So I Googled especially um, how circus, circuses train animals, how they train specifically elephants. Okay? How do they get these 13,000 pound giants? And that's not an exaggeration. I actually looked that up. Remember, Wikipedia man. Okay? 13,000 pound animal to get up on their hind legs and do crazy stuff for our amusement. How do you even get them to that point? You know, how do you make it, how do you make such a gigantic, majestic animal who can crush 80 of us all at once to do silly tricks? And the results I found were pretty heartbreaking, as you would imagine. Um, They have a, a variety of techniques, but the goal is pretty much the same. It's to break the elephant's spirit. And what they do is they actually take the elephant's baby away right when they're born okay and the baby 
is led out and they, they put this pole in the ground and then they chain the baby to the pole. And throughout the baby's life, the baby is only allowed to walk around that pole. Okay? And so that pole, that radius around the pole becomes their entire world. They're not allowed to roam free. They're not allowed to go see other things. That's their world, the pole. And here's where it gets kind of interesting. <clears throat> as they get older, as they hit their teenage, young adult years, the circus trainers do something really peculiar. They take off the chain. And because the baby has been conditioned to think that the pole is their world, they will never go past the radius of that chain all day long. Just in that, they, like, even if the chain isn't there, that pole is their world. And if they want to move this 13,000 pound elephant, all they have to do is pick up the pole and move to another place and put it down and the, and the baby will follow the pole and walk around the radius of that thing. It's cruel and unusual and it's terrible, but it's also a really great metaphor for our lives, I feel like. I don't care what you say about yourself. We are all, every single one of us here have been hurt. Every single one of us has been emotionally scarred. Every single one of us has gone through trauma. And oftentimes, that is the pole that we are trained to, isn't it? Yeah. It paints an entire picture, like it, it paints your entire world with that, right? When you've gone through some kind of a trauma, all you can do is see through that lens and it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can go to Metro, you can go to a different church, you can go to a different country, you can go to a different continent. You will always see yourself through the lens of that trauma. How is that not but slavery to that thing, that trauma? And it's not just one, it's a bunch of them, right? <clears throat> But I have some good news for you folks. We are destined actually to live that way unchecked. Okay? We will live the rest of our lives through the lens of those past experiences, but God does not want that for his children. He is a good God. He is a God who loves his children, who wants his children to be free and happy and contented and all that. Not that he doesn't challenge us. He does absolutely challenge us. But what good father doesn't want good things for his children? And so I want to just go over just three things that the Holy Spirit has inspired me to, to talk about through our passage today. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. What so, uh, what, how do we break the chains of the past and move into the future? I'm going to give you three practices. The first one is that God gives us hope for the future when we go back to the painful experiences of our lives. Now, the, the Holy Spirit does something really funny here. Can I get the map again? Okay, so they're here at Derby. They have gone through all the trauma, all the experiences, things like that, and Paul wants to be home. He wants to go home. Right? And all he has to do is go through the mountains over here, stopping in Tarsus, because for those of you who don't know, Paul is from Tarsus. This is hometown. He could, st he could go through these mountains, which is, which is kind of hard, but like once you hit Tarsus, it's easy walking to Antioch. He could stop in Tarsus, grab a meal from mom, hang out with grandma and grandpa, childhood friends and stuff, chill out there for a little bit, and then just just leisurely walk back to Antioch. He could do that. But then the Holy Spirit strikes again. And as Paul is just getting ready to go towards Tarsus, his body broken and beaten and stuff from all the trauma, he turns to Barnabas and says, Barnabas, I, I know this sounds insane and I have no idea why, but I feel like we got to go back to Lystra and Iconium and Pisidian Antioch and Perga and all these places that we've gone to, gone to the experience where we've been kicked out and maimed and destroyed. I feel like we have to do that. And so that's what him and Barnabas do. Folks, God wants you to go back to some of those experiences that you had. 
Serious. It sounds insane. It sounds crazy because after all, you're out of it. You've done it. Like you've, you've come out of that position of hurt and things like that. Why would you want to go back to that? Why would you want to go back to the sites where, where you've experienced so much trauma and pain and, 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 and destruction of your soul? Why would you want to go back there? Well, for the same reason why God asked Paul to go back there. Because the work's not done. You see, <clears throat> when Paul was in all of these places, he had to leave quick. Real quick. Okay? There was no goodbyes. There was no, there were, there was no tying up loose ends. There was no closure. There's none of that stuff. And so God asked him to go back there to check up on these, the, on the work that he's been doing there. And in the same way, folks, I really believe that God asks us to go backwards, back to those traumatic points in our lives because the work is not done. Yes, you have survived, and that's great. It really is. You've, we're going we're to talk about that a, a little bit. You know, but God asks you to go backwards because there's work left undone in those moments. Okay? You have loose ends to tie up. You've got, you've, got, you've got to get some closure on some stuff. You need to talk to some people. You know, there's a lot of things that you need to be doing. You know? <clears throat> and um, we have to get to the point of grieving and emoting. I want you to know this. Like, it's going to sound crazy, and this is going to sound completely like insane and backwards, but God does want you to be sad sometimes. It is okay to sit in your sadness. You know? It is okay to be broken over the sin that has been done to you. It is okay to do that. Not, you know, you're, not supposed, you're not supposed to sit there and just like, you know, let that become your identity because then you're just putting a chain down again. Yes, there is hope for you, but it is totally okay. And God wants you to emote and to grieve and to be sad about what has gone on. Those tears need to fall, folks. Because it is in those tears, it is in that grieving process where healing is found. Healing is found in your soul when tears fall, folks. So <clears throat> here's what you need to do, okay? Because, okay, so let me, let, me, let me backtrack just a little bit. If you do not do this, you know what happens? They leak out. They really do, okay? You may not think so, but they do, okay? You know that moment where you get just a little too upset about your wife putting your keys in a different place? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, when you get a little too upset and you like yell and scream and throw things and stuff like that, it's like, she just put the keys in a different place. It's okay, you know? <laughs> you know, that's the result of unprocessed emotion somewhere else. You know? Um, parents, how many of you are parents in here? How many of you have ever smacked your kid just a little too hard for something really stupid? You know? I, I, my, I slapped my poor boy because he was, he, we, we had to go out the door to, to get to school because I woke up late, you know, and, and he was like, oh, I'm so slow, daddy, and just, you know, like, I mean, I'm ashamed to admit that I did it, but that's what happened, you know? This is what happens when you have unprocessed stuff. It leaks out, you know? Um, you ever fly off the handle when someone slides into the parking spot that you were waiting for, especially around Christmas? It's like emotional leakage. That's what happens. What we need to do is we need to process these things. We need to make intentional time to do so. Okay? Um, we had a... I, I recently had a friend move in with us, and he's awesome. He's like the best roommate ever. Like he's, a, he's, he's the type of roommate that like leaves super early in the morning before anyone wakes up and then comes home late at night. I haven't seen my friend in like a week. The only reason why I know that he's, he, he's even like here is because I have, the, I have that doorbell camera, and I see him coming in and out. And that, that, that's the only reason why I know. He's, he's the best. But in order for him to come in, I had to clear out my man cave. I gave up my man cave for my friend. Okay. And you know, you know those things that are in your room that you mean to get to, 
but really you just sit, sit them there and they sit there for like years. My seminary books, yep. I had a lot of seminary books, books that I haven't opened since seminary, books I didn't open during seminary. <laughs> <clears throat> I picked these books up out of my man cave and I put them in the only free space that I knew, which was the attic. And I, so I, I tromped them up into the attic, set them down in just whatever places, just finding pla like uh, different spots everywhere and came downstairs, closed the door, done, right? And then God does his like Holy Spirit thing and I, I really hate it when he does that sometimes, right? Just, he goes, boy. When God's upset with me, he calls me boy. Boy, if you don't do something about those books upstairs right now, they're going to sit up there for years collecting dust and you will never, ever, ever be able to use that attic again if you don't deal with those things. And so I'm still not done to this day, but what I had to do was I had to make, intention, make intentional time out of my schedule on Mondays, which is my Sabbath, to go upstairs, pick up a book, open it up, figure out what the heck is in there, and then decide what to do with it. Do I give it away? Do I sell it? Do I keep it? Is it useful to me? What do I need to do with this? Going back to your past experience is a little bit like opening up a bunch of books. You would really need to make some intentional time for it. You know, take 30 minutes out of, out of your day during a week. Say, I'm going to process this emotion today. I'm going to process this experience today. And just allow the Lord to speak to you. It takes intentionality, folks. It's not going to happen just on its own. Now, if um, <clears throat> I, I happen to be a verbal, I, I happen to be a, um, a, a person who writes to process, and journals are great. Use journals. If you're like an introvert like me who, who likes to process their thoughts on paper, do that. But I know not everybody is like that. My wife is a verbal processor. You know? Folks, if, if you need someone to process this information with, find someone. Okay? Go to counseling. Find a therapist. It's totally okay. The stigma is gone. It's okay to, to go to therapy now. Everybody does it. You know, it's worth spending money on. It really is. Okay. Um, find a pastor. We pastors, I'm, I was shocked when I first came here to, to Metro, when I asked, you know, the different pastors, like, how, how many people you have coming to see you on a regular basis and stuff? I was shocked at the number. It's such a low number. It's ridiculous. It really is. Nobody is coming to see these amazing men and women. You know, find a past, at the very least, find your small group leader or a trusted friend because we know, we know that not every friend is trustworthy, okay? But um, <clears throat> find a trusted friend to confide in and to reveal these things and to process these emotions with, with, with. and do it often, do it regularly. It's not a one-time thing. There's no way you're going to be healed from a lifetime of hurt and emotional pain just through one session. It's not going to happen. So do that, folks. So that's, that's point number one. You do that. Make some, take some intentional time. That's, that's, that's a, a step in the road to healing. But number two, God gives us hope for a future when we exercise our authority over our pain. Now, Paul goes back to these cities. And he's expecting that all of his work that he has done would be in shambles. Because... The Roman authorities, the Jewish people were so rude and mean to him. It was just a matter of, matter of time before they got to this church, these churches, right? But surprisingly, Paul goes back and he sees that the churches that he has planted have survived. And that is cause for celebration. You all in here, are sitting in here today because you are survivors. You have survived. We have emotional pain, we have abuse. People in here have been raped. There's been some really terrible things that have done, been done to us, but you are here. 
and you have survived. And that is because of the grace of God, and that is also the cause for celebration. You have survived, and that is great. That is amazing. And that is only that, that's because of the work of Jesus Christ in your life. It's great. It's awesome. But now that you have survived, God wants you to take another step. He really does. He wants you to take another step, folks. And he wants you to, to, uh, to claim authority over those experiences. Because up to this point, those experiences have been chains to us. Right? We cannot see the world outside of those experiences. You know, we cannot do it. But God wants to give you today the gift of perspective. Perspective is such a powerful, powerful, powerful tool in the healing process. Perspective is everything. Here, I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective, okay? Um, <clears throat> I wonder what would happen if this, the elephant, we're going back to the elephant. I wonder if, what would happen if the elephant one day, as he's walking around his radius without the chain on, one day wakes up and realizes, I'm an elephant. I am 13,000 pounds. I am 12 feet tall. I am 20 feet long. I can destroy 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 of these oppressors upon me. I am that powerful. What would that elephant do? That elephant would claim his authority over the people. He would, okay? She would. You know, they would go and they would claim their authority. They would run free the way that their God had intentionally made them. And anyone who would try to rechain them back to the pole, they would simply destroy or they would simply snap off the chain. Here's some perspective for you. I know you've gone through so much pain. You've gone through traumatic experience. You've been raped. You've been destroyed. You've been, you've been, the devil has really tried to like mess you up in this life. But because of the work of Jesus Christ on that cross and that resurrection, you are spiritual giants. There is no experience in this life that will mess you up so bad that you cannot eventually come back to health. You can run free. That is, that, that is your inheritance. God meant for you to run free, free from all of these experiences. Like I said, God does challenge you. Don't get me wrong. You know, he does. But his desire for you, his desire for his children is to be free. Free to be yourself like beautifully and wonderfully and without, with, without anything hindering you. He, that is his will for you. That's what he wants from you. So folks... <clears throat> I want you to do something. For, I, I, no, I don't, I don't want you to do something. I, I want to I tell you a few things, right? So um, <clears throat> being free is about having that perspective that the chain is no longer on you. Okay? So for those of you, maybe you're at work or in your mommy's group or your, your community groups or your church or things like that, and you have this great idea. And this idea is just burning inside you, but inside you feel this voice, this shame that says, who the heck are you? You're dumb. There's, there's more important than people than you that have greater ideas from you. You just shut your trap. You just sit, sit quietly and just do what you're asked. Folks, that shame is that chain. That's come from childhood experiences. That's come from someone telling you that you are not good enough, that you are not smart enough. But I'm here to tell you, the, in Jesus' name, there's no chain there. There's nothing there. Okay? There is nothing there. So you lift your head. Lift your head. Don't, put, don't cast your eyes to the ground. I know what that feels like. I struggle with shame too. Don't cast your eyes to the ground. Look up. Look the people right in the eyes and express your idea. You are worthy of respect. You are worthy of attention because you are a child of God. Amen. Express yourself, folks. The change just simply isn't there. It's not. It's not. It's not. For those of you who, um, who come in day in, day out into this church, and you see, you see this person that you like admire so much, 
you know? And they're constantly surrounded by people and you think to yourself, I would really like to get to know that person. I really think that they, ha- they have something to offer. But, you know, they, 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 they wouldn't want anything to do with me, you know? I, I'm not even going to bother asking. There's, there's other people who need this person more. I'm not going to bother. Folks, that is shame. That is a chain that has been put on you. But again, the chain isn't there. God wants you to be healthy and well and all that stuff. God wants you to be free. So folks, be free. Go and ask that person out for coffee. Go and ask that pastor to to have a chat. Go to a pastor and ask him to process something with you regularly. I promise you, you come with the right heart, with the right mindset, no one's going to turn you down. The chain isn't there in Jesus' name. It really isn't. How much time do I have? Do I have have time for one more? I don't have time for one more. I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, My last point is that the point of all this, the point of the processing, the point of, the, um, uh, of the, the sharing and all that stuff is not just so that you can be healed, folks. At the end of the day, everything is about glorifying Jesus. Everything is about glorifying, even your pain is about Jesus. I want you to know this, okay? Now what Paul does, Paul and Barnabas, after they complete the trip, after they, they, they um, hire elders and goes back to those and, and puts authority over all of the, the churches and stuff, they go back to Antioch, their home church, and they start gathering people together. Hey, hey, Paul and Barnabas is back. Gather together. And Paul and Barnabas starts to talk about their entire journey. Okay? They talk about their victories, how the Gentiles are just coming together in mass. They even, they talk about their hurts and their brokenness. And Paul's body, who is mangled at this point, okay, visibly mangled. You don't walk away from a rock stoning, not having visible scars on your face. And they're telling the story of how God has been faithful throughout the whole thing. Folks, you need, after you're, as you're going through the whole process of like the, of telling your, to, to, of uh, reprocessing and, and things like that, you need to be telling your church. You need to be telling other believers, really. Because in the telling of these stories, you glorify the Lord. In doing so, folks, um, <clears throat> for those of you who are new here, uh, one of the, um, one of the core tenets of Metro is we, we like to be transparent. We like to be open. We, we understand we're all broken. We all have pain and sorrow, and uh, we should share with each other. So I want to share with you today um, uh, a, a, a very traumatic event that happened to me when I was a kid that defines who I am today. And um, I want to show you God's hand in all of it and, and stuff like that. And so that's how I want to end today, okay? So... <clears throat> When I was really, really young, um, I don't even know how old I was, maybe five to seven years old. It's, it's one of my earliest memories. And I remember sitting down uh, with my mom on one of those like Korean fold-out tables, the black ones that have like a, the designs and crap on it. And <clears throat> on, t- on top of an electric blanket, because all Korean households have an electric blanket. Okay? <laughs> and my mom was trying to teach me long division. Who the heck cares about long division? I haven't done long division since I was like 10. Anyway, uh, she's trying to teach me long division and I'm just not getting it. It's just not making any sense to me, right? And you know, Asian household, so my mom's like smacking me in the head hoping to knock something loose, you know, to to get them to get, get me to be able to do long division just like that, right? And it's just not working. And then so my dad comes in and he sees me, he sees us struggling, he sees my mom struggling, he was like, I got this, I got this, right? And he comes down and he sits down next to me on the other side and he tries to teach me long division. And um, <clears throat> still not getting it, still not getting it. What would happen in the next moment would 
really mess me up for the rest of my life up until relatively recently for me. As I was trying to do long division, I don't know who struck first, but somebody slapped me across the face. And so your head would swivel one way, but then as the head was swiveling this way, another hand would come and smack the other way. And back and forth and back and forth it went. The, the two people in my life that should have been protecting me lost control over some long division. And the message that sent to me that I carried around for so many years There's nobody on your side. You have no advocate. No one's going to help you. Even the ones that you think you can trust, you shouldn't trust because they're going to hurt you. And so for years, I did everything myself. If I'm going to make it and survive out of this life, I got to do it all by myself. And so that's what I did. You know, and... For a pastor, that's a really terrible trait. It really is. You know, I refused help. I, I didn't trust anybody. And that ch chained me for 30 some odd years. But God, right? <laughs> he, uh, you know, I talked to pastors, I talked to counselors, I went to therapy and all that stuff. I'm still doing some therapy, you know, um, worked through a lot. Of, but God spoke through a wonderful sister who didn't even know that she was speaking to me. We were, we were talking about compl something completely different, right? Um, it was actually Catrice, um, who leads worship here on stage. She said the three most powerful words to me that anyone has said to me in a really long time, so simple, but it was exactly what I needed. The Holy Spirit spoke through her and it hit my heart so, so, so profoundly. Christy said to me, friend, be free. That's it. And that so like spoke to me because in that moment I realized, wow, I'm still chained to this experience. But the experience, it, it, it ended 30 some odd years ago. It's not there anymore. Yes, some people will hurt me if I trust them. But then, how many people have I missed out in, my, in so many years that are trustworthy? Who could have helped me heal? Folks, that is the power of God that he can take something so deep, so broken, so messed up. And I'm not saying I'm, not, I'm completely recovered for it. I'm not. But I'm not where I was a year ago. And I continue on this journey towards healing. And maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. But the Lord will heal this soul just as much as he'll heal yours. Uh, can we um, can we go to God right now, um, man? I really feel like His Word was just so powerful today, um, and I don't speak that. I don't say that as your preacher. I say that as your brother, as a fellow co-sufferer. If anything, that 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 uh, that message was for you and for me. And I feel like the Lord wants so many of you in this moment to tell you that it's time to get to work. It's time to revisit some of those things that you've been avoiding for so long. Let this be that moment that the work begins. 
I really feel like just in this space, this moment, as you've heard this message, there's that one thing, that one experience, that one emotional trauma, that one thing that has happened to you that he's putting in your mind right now. And I want to give you some time, not very long, I want to just give you 30 seconds just to interact with that. Let the Lord start to speak. And if you would be brave enough, why don't you pray over it? And I don't mean just pray like silently in your mind. I think there's something so powerful about moving your lips and actually speaking the words and acknowledging that, Jesus, I am sad about this. I am angry about this. Now, you don't have to speak it out loud because I know that, you know, you don't want to spew your business all, all out and everywhere, but at least just move your lips in this moment and offer up a prayer to God and just talk to him. Talk to him about what's on your heart and your soul right now. I want to give you just 30 seconds to do that right now. Jesus, oh Jesus, great Father who loves us, who cares so much about his children. I want to lift up my family here to you. They come from so many different backgrounds, so many different pains. And whether it be big or small, they all matter to you. So Lord, I pray that the work that's just begun in this space doesn't just stop outside of this, these doors. I pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit that you inspire these people to keep, keep on, to keep on working. This is a lifelong journey. That's something that will ultimately be healed by you, Lord, but you asked us to work towards it. So God, I want to pray a prayer of blessing upon the journeyers here, the workers here who are working on their souls. May your spirit be upon them. May your countenance be on their face. May your, may your soul align with theirs. Thank you for the blessings of your church, of your family, the hospital in which healing takes place. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Uh, I have a few next steps to, um, to, to go with. The um, first one is the same as every week. Uh, if you're ex accepting Jesus Christ for the first time, if you've never heard the name of Jesus, if you don't know what this Jesus person is all about, and you just, or maybe you, you do and you have some questions, go ahead and check that box off. And we will have someone get in contact with you and you know hang out with you and talk to you and to try to go through, um, go, go to wade through some of these, um, these questions and such that you have. So accepting Jesus for the first time, check that off. Um, second one, I will intentionally set aside time this week to reflect upon my hardships. Go again. Like I said, if your if journaling is your thing, journal, find time. Okay. In this moment, make that decision right now in your, in this moment, when are you going to get this done? Okay, your schedule is packed. I get it. We live on the East Coast. But that being said, cut something off so that you can do this. This is important for you. Okay, this is important for your soul. Okay. Um, uh, next one, I will actively seek out a counselor or clo close friend to process my past with this week. Hey, this is related to the first, uh, the, the one I just talked about before. If you are a verbal processor, hey, ask that person. Okay, even if it looks like they're busy and they got a whole bunch of people, what's the worst that can happen? If you ask them, what's the worst thing that'll happen? They say, hey, I'll get to you 
on this week or that week. Pastors are not cruel people. We, we love you. We love hearing your problems. We do. You know, we love hearing your issues. You know, um, schedule regular time to process some of your past with. Um, next one, I will attend the Connections Dinner on uh, May 19th. Uh, if you're new to Metro and you don't know anything of what we're about or you just want to meet Pastor Peter, um, on May 19th, a Connections Dinner is at his house where he will, you know, he'll feed you uh, with some really, really great food and he'll give you... Uh, give you just like a little background of what the what the church has been and what our vision is and things like that and so that's really good um last one i think uh, is just so important that i don't think a lot of us do but you need to really prepare your hearts for the message that you're going to receive next week okay and so when we talk about i will read acts 15 1 through 21 before next week take that seriously make that a part of your devotionals this week read the passage before you get here 